episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings, not just focusing on their successes, but more important, shining a spotlight on the road they traveled to get there. Now, this week's guest, she comes to me through a dear friend of mine, and he told me, Sean, if there's ever a favor that I'm going to ask of you, you got to interview this woman. She's so dope. And I'm like, she can't be that dope. He's like, this is the only favor I ever asked of you, and I need you to do it. So please welcome. And even as I started to research her, I was like, I get it. Like, <laughs> this ain't even a favor no more, because I'm so looking forward to this interview this is a woman who has really dominated the tech industry, being at the helm of an amazing company, Popcom, and just doing her thing in a male-dominated world of tech. I'm looking forward to this interview, and I know my, my, my audience is going to get so much out of it. Please welcome to this week's Power Move Maker series, Ms. Dawn Dixon. Dawn, what up? Thanks, Sean. Thanks for the amazing intro. You know, I'm ready too. I'm, I'm glad you took the favor. <laughs> shout out to our friend Amir. You know something, though? And, and yeah, definitely shout out to my boy Amir, both of our boy Amir. He, it started out, he he hit me up random. And I, like I said, I had never heard of you before. And I told him, you know what, Amir, you don't come to me for anything. I'll do it. He knows the platform very well. But as I started looking into your story and your journey, you're the reason Power Move Maker series was created. Your story exemplifies everything that we do on this podcast. It exemplifies why I wanted to bring this thing to light because I think it's so important for us to shine a light on people like yourself, people who start from humble beginnings, people who don't take no for an answer, people who have an idea, a vision, and are willing to work on it year over year over year to see it come to fruition through all of the ups, the downs, the bumps, the bruises. And your story exemplifies it all. So I can't wait to dive into it. Yes, thank you. So Dawn, let's start from the beginning because you're not the traditional, I guess, when I think of the Silicon Valley person, when I think of somebody who is heading a tech company, you got, you're coming out of Columbus, Ohio. Is that not correct? That's true. That's where I, that's my hometown. And now that's where our headquarters is. So yes, it's definitely not the typical profile of who you would see as a tech, uh, as a tech CEO, just, just historically, right? Things are changing now, but you're absolutely right. I'm not the profile, you know, I'm not the pattern that they usually match for. Is, is this where you're from? Is this where your family, you're born and raised? Yeah, born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. My family's really between Columbus and LA, the LA area. So I actually was building the company in LA and moved back to Columbus because we were able to attract significant amount of venture capital and investors to Columbus because really at the time in 2016, there just wasn't many black women or black people starting companies. And the VC industry was getting really hit hard talking about how they discriminate and how biased they were. So they were like dying to find good black founders so they can say, hey, look at us, we have, we got a black, you know? And so that's kind of what happened. I had a very, very solid business model, got out of Techstars, but then I went back to Ohio so that, you know, in retrospect, I was definitely the token black person. <laughs> I hear you. Okay, so you got to talk to me because this is not my world. So I, I'm going to learn as much in this interview as anybody who listens to it on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the other streaming services or watches it on YouTube. So just bear with me for a second. You're in tech. Yes. But what's your background? What's your education like? Were, were you groomed for this industry or did it just happen? That's funny. It, it kind of did happen, but I did go to school for it. So when I went to college, I went to the Ohio State University, go Bucks, and I studied journalism and, um, and marketing. And then I also had a minor in African and African American studies because that's my passion. But I really, I really wanted to be an MTV VJ. That's the truth. I wanted to be like Lala. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm about to get this degree and I'm going to go to New York and I'm about to be on Total Request Live, like period. <laughs> so... You know, as I was working towards my degree, I had to get a job in my field, so which was news media. 
-hmm. and I got a job at the local television station just so I could have it on my resume, build relationships, of course, as you do when you're in college. But the job they gave me was not working in like production or working on the news desk. They gave me the job to work the internet desk doing FTP. Now, if anybody is as old as me, you know, they know the FTP is how you to transfer things online, you know, it's a protocol. And what was happening back then was that it was the first station in Ohio to upload news to the internet. So this is the very beginning of like streaming and it wasn't live streaming. There was no such thing as live streaming yet. It was just, you can watch the news later, but no one really knew how to do it. So they gave me the task of figuring out how to do it and working that, that task every day. And I realized like, wait a minute, if I have tech skills, I have an advantage over everybody in this newsroom because the only people that knew how to do what I was doing was the IT guy, which everybody had like one IT guy back in the day. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, me, he trains me. And I said, I should go back to school and get some tech skills to add to my toolkit for the job force. It was never like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I didn't really think about that. And so I decided to go just to DeVry. Like literally, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And I Google like, how do you get tech skills? Like, you know, they have those commercials. Remember, we will always see DeVry, ITT Tech and all of these mm -hmm. random like you know, go to get some skills. So I said, okay, well, I want some tech skills. So I'm gonna go take this year long bachelor program just to learn skills to enhance my ability to get a better paying job in the media industry. Because at the time they were paying like starting out 20,000. Even back then, that is not what I was trying to get paid. Like, even though it was 20 some years ago. So that's how I got into tech, realizing that you know, between AOL sending out instant messenger CDs all over it, you got free, you know, download instant messenger. I just seen it taken off and I didn't understand what was happening, but I knew it was the future. You know what I mean? I got that feeling like something big's happening and I don't want to get left out. You know, I think it's so dope. I want to point out something you said. Here you are, you thinking that your, your future is going to lie in front of the camera. You're going to be a VJ on... Uh, TRL, MTV, you're going to be the next Lala Anthony. But in doing your day job, you were able to identify a white space. Hey, there's only one person here who is an IT guy. He's the only guy who, I, who understands tech. And now I'm understanding it. So if I go and I enhance my skill set, it's gonna make me invaluable. At the time, I'm assuming you're thinking at that company, but still in all, I think that, and maybe this is a trait of entrepreneurs, it's a trait of very successful people, but in the moment to identify the area in need, identify where you can stand out and excel, even if it wasn't your chosen path. I think that that's so great that you pointed that out, Dawn. Thank you. I mean, I was looking really like, how can I give myself a competitive advantage when mm -hmm. there's so many people who want my spot? And you know, it's like, you know, it's like any industry, you got to get in the door somehow. So I'm like, if I get in the door as in the tech department, I could at least be there. So when they need, hey, somebody need to do produce production, somebody, hey, we the, 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 the reporter called off, go cover this story, <laughs> waiting for my shot. You know what I mean? I just knew if I could get into the station because back then it was so hard to get into the media industry at all and especially in front of the camera. But when I went to school, that's when I realized like, oh wow, these jobs pay way more than any media job is gonna ever pay me unless I am actually La La Anthony. And that's gonna take me a while to get to those six figure checks. Meanwhile, the tech, in the tech um, business development space, they were starting out in the analyst spot, like 50,000 right out. And this is again, this is in 2000, mm -hmm. year 2000. So that was a high salary for a 20 year old in the year 2000. I Absolutely. Mean, in general, like I was living amazing <laughs> back then. So that's why I changed. You know, once I got into school for tech, then again, once again, in school at tech, and they're like, hey, we're looking for interns. Now keep in mind, I'm in this tech program. No women, no black people at all. And they're coming to our class recruiting because back then in 2000, companies were dying for engineers and people that knew tech. Every company that we know had to get email, had to get servers, intranet, moving their whole business from paper. When I started my job, they literally were sending out fax blasts. That was literally fax blasts, no email blasts, 
backsplash. So somebody had to move them into the digital age and they were hiring like crazy. So I got an internship and my internship was like $15 an hour, which to this day, people don't even make that a lot. And so I'm like, wait a minute, the money is just too good. I'm about to switch my whole career. And I mean, that's literally exactly what I did. I loved the money and I loved knowing things that were coming. I loved like having that inside scoop that like knowing tech, understanding technology, understanding what's the future, what's coming up, being able to speak this language that was very rare at the time, especially in my community. Once again, I'm black female and in Ohio, but I'm in tech. And it just led me to... Then starting my very first tech company in 2001, which was a media platform. So I stayed close to my heart in media, Mm -hmm. but I realized like, wait a minute, I can code now. I can build tech. I can build infrastructure systems. I can do all these things with computers, but I'm 21 years old. What am I going to do with it to benefit my life besides just at work? And I started looking at all the use cases. You want to ask me something? Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I started looking at all the use cases and I'm like, there's so many things we can do with this tech, but nobody's using it in my community. And again, I, I just graduated from my undergrad and I was, you probably remember the days when the only way to find out what's going on is from a flyer, like a physical piece of paper, <laughs> a hot card, or you know, word of mouth, or in the newspaper, sometimes they would have like a weekender edition. And all the young people at Ohio State and in the city were like, We want to find out what's going on. We want to know what's the cool thing to do, the new clubs, parties, concerts. So I started a website and it was the first of its kind besides at the time, only one thing out there was Social Step, which was based in DC. And then they started building up like Atlanta started building up event websites. Like I think ATL Picks popped up around that time, a couple years later. But other than that, there were not any directories of events going on for young people to find out or people in general, what to do, what restaurants, what parties, what you know, nightclubs, a listing online. That was like literally one of the first. It was called the Urban Star and it grew really fast. We got over 100,000 hits a month. We were we had over 12,000 people on our email list. And back then, the only way to get an email list was to get the actual email written down. Mm-hmm. So I had a street team. Because again, I came from like promotions and marketing. So I got a street team. I seen this working in the music business. I said, okay, let's turn this into, you know, tech business too. And got the girls out with some belly shirts and some sequin t-shirts and asking people, can we have your email address to put you on our list to find out about events in 12,000 people. And I personally hand typed all those emails into an Excel and I copied and pasted them every single Friday. I spent five hours on every Friday copying and pasting, you know, emails into a BCC and AOL because there were no such thing as an email management client back then. There was no MailChimp. There was no constant contact. There was no... None of that. And so that was my real start in tech, just solving my own problems, figuring my way through it. To all my movers, if you love educational and inspirational content just like this, please like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. But most important, if you know anybody making power moves just like you, share it. Now back to the video. That's incredible. Um, and you said a couple of things that I really want to focus on for a second. Let's talk love for what you do, right? Because I I, I just don't believe that any of us can excel. Maybe it's possible to excel, but you'll hate your life. You'll hate your day. Uh, But you are, you, 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 you made a point to say the money was great. Absolutely was. In year 2000, having an internship that pays $15 an hour, in 2021, there are people who don't make $15 an hour. Just is what it is. So you were balling, and it ain't like living in Columbus, Ohio, is living in Manhattan, New York. So the cost of living is way different in Columbus. So you were doing well. But the love, was it immediate for you? Did you did you start to say to yourself, I know I'm getting paid well, so, so that's a motivator. But I'm learning this whole other industry that is new. It is something that I can see a huge future with. Yeah. Every industry, every corporation, every brand is gonna need to incorporate tech into their day-to-day practices. 
Did you immediately love it? I loved it once I realized how I could use it in my life. I loved it once I started my own thing with it. You know, like I loved it when I realized I can change my life and people's live, lives around me. So for my internship, they, they gave me a full-time position there. So with stock options, nationwide insurance, a position in stock options. And so I was like officially working for the man, you know, insurance, benefits, stock option, retirement. My family's happy. I made it. I got a BMW. <laughs> I have a little mortgage. I made it. And I just realized I was very not very, very unhappy. And I was doing very well at work. Again, you know, making 50,000 at this time, I was 21, excelling. But I realized there was no really upward mobility for me. So that's when I started to say, like, I didn't love going to work anymore. I didn't love it at all. It just was like, I'm going to work, doing my tasks. I was very bright. So I was like, blasting through my work I would sit at my desk for hours a day with no work to do because I was so productive mm -hmm. and I'm like this is not what I want my life to be if I'm 21 now what's the end goal I'm gonna sit here for 40 years like when do you retire normally 65 I'm gonna sit here for like 40 years for real and this is my life and this is what my family wanted me to do they was like you made it stay in this job you got your college degree go ahead and retire you're you're straight and I was like, this can't be it. So once I realized I could apply what I learned at my corporate job, and I was working for the president of this subsidiary. So I was like really in the executive meetings as a young person and seeing how real organizations are ran. And I'm like, I can do this. I can start my own business. And so while I was working there, I started my own business, Urban Star, and I quit within eight months. I didn't even make it a year at the job. And I've been an entrepreneur full time since then, since April 2001. Okay, stop there for one second. This, what you did is so commendable, but I find that so many people have such a hard time, number one, admitting I'm unhappy. It's safe, it's secure, I'm making money, I should be happy, should. but I'm unhappy. You said your family is looking at you. Great, you did it, you made it, yes. you're the one. I'm the shining star. You're the shining star. We have all been there. But I love to hear stories like this where people, number one, this it's in tune with that inner voice. They're in yes, that's what it is, Sean. I love that you said that. It's that inner voice. It's your inner guidance system that tells you what to do. And we don't listen all the time. And that's when we suffer. That's when we suffer. It, 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 because... When that inner voice is speaking to you and it's pulling at you and it's pulling, it's, it's letting you, this can't be my life. Mm -hmm. Most people drown it out. Most they people, do. they use every excuse in the book to justify saying, it, it, this is great. I, I shouldn't listen to that voice. But even in your case, listening, although you're going out into the unknown, I know to some people you looked nuts going oh, from this stable... Sure. Yeah, going from a stable position, benefits, stock options, and you're going to start an online event promotion platform. Right. Huh? Huh? Exactly. Are you crazy? I lost okay. your mind. My mom used to say, at this point, she gave up and they were like, we don't even know what you do because I didn't understand this. This is the website. This is WWW World Wide Web. These are, they was not on that. And so people say, what does Dawn do? She said, Dawn got a Tommy job, like from Martin. Like Dawn got a Tommy job. <laughs> Nobody knows what Dawn does. She's like Tommy. Like that was the story for 10 years in my family. Nobody understood. Even though it's clearly out there, you can go to my website. They didn't take it serious at all. How long did you have that website? I ran the website with my partner for six years. And then I had a consulting company that I kind of spun at spun out, spun out from the website because it, it created a demand for my services. Mm -hmm. That I said, I have a big opportunity promoting, instead of promoting these events online, to be a consultant and help build out bigger events and also help companies to create um, digital marketing strategy. Because I did something very disruptive and new. I built an email list of 12,000 plus people in 2003, and I was getting very high conversion rates, and I was getting over 100,000 unique hits. Again, no algorithms, none of the things that exist today. This is pure organic guerrilla word of mouth marketing. And so I went on to teach many other businesses how to do this. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's segue. Yes. 
Yes. You're an entrepreneur now. Yes. You're out there for six years. You have figured out whether it is through your online business, um, offline being a consultant. I can feed myself. I can do this. Yes. One thing I know about entrepreneurs is in the beginning, it's scary as hell. It really is. Uh, but at some point, there's this arc, right? You're scared to start, especially in a case like yours and so many other people who come from uh, stable jobs in secure situations. It's scared because you don't know where your next check's coming from. But you, you go out there, you do this for six years. And again, like I said, it's this art. It happens in entrepreneurship. You go from relying on a check to not being able to conceive working and getting a steady paycheck. I eat what I kill. I don't know any other way. Yep. I'm just wired differently now. The thought of going in, punching a clock, working for someone else, it just doesn't mesh with me. That's because you know you have potential to kill a lot. There you go. You know, the ceil there's no ceiling. There's a ceiling when you punch in a clock. It's what they give you. But when you rely on you, there's no limit. That's That's what drives me. Correct. So talk to me, you, you come up with this ingenious idea for your next business, uh, Flat Out Heels. Yes. Can you talk to us about how that idea was conceived? What is Flat Out Heels? Why you decided to, to go into this area? Because it's, it's not tech. Yep. It, is, it is not consulting. You're now in the product business. How did it come into play? Again, in my life, I'm looking back at my life and see how everything played out. Everything really happened for a reason and it all comes together. So for me having Urban Star doing events, promotions, then I go to have V1 Consulting Group, consulting, um, marketing and digital marketing. It led me to, I moved to Atlanta when the recession hit because Columbus was under recession and I was losing clients. They, they First thing people do, which is insane, when they start losing money, they cut the marketing budget. That is ridiculous you need the marketing budget before you need anything else because you need customers but anyway right. they cut the marketing budget which meant me and so i'm like where can i go that's recession proof what industries are recession proof we have a couple but the two i really focused on was sports and entertainment they're recession proof people are going to still go out have drinks they're going to still do their sports regardless of what's going on in the economy we've seen this over and over again and so i moved to atlanta because they had these things sports and entertainment and i could be a consultant down there, which led me to working with athletes and entertainers for five years. And I worked with them on their events. I did celebrity weekends, nonprofit events, marketing, websites, just all kinds of turnkey consulting, which led me to lots of parties, clubs, and you know Atlanta, so <laughs> the full run. <laughs> We've seen it all. But most importantly, I've seen women walking around barefoot at the, at the table, at the section, popping by with their shoes off, you know, walking outside after the club, dirty feet, all these things. And of course, I'm out and my feet hurt. And I thought to myself, we need some kind of a shoe that women can carry with us in our purse or, you know, in our car glove box so that we can put them on when our feet hurt in heels. This is before I was like into the conference and business traveling life as a, as a professional like I am now. So it was all motivated by like clubs and parties. And you know, I fished the idea around and people were like, yeah, I would love some shoes I could put in my purse. I think it's a great idea. And I'm like, you know, well, how do we get them to women when their feet hurt the most? What is the best distribution channel? I'm always like, that's how I think, like, what can I do to disrupt things? So even though it wasn't tech, I'm always thinking about innovation. What's next? What is a dif differentiator? Again, with my career before, my tech skills differentiated me in the newsroom. How can I differentiate my products, which are shoes, from everybody else's shoes? I'll make them rollable, foldable, machine washable, and I'll put them in vending machines so that when you're at the club or at the airport or at the concert, you can buy some flats in a machine. Stop that here for one second. Yeah. And I'm sorry to interject. Did this idea exist? Did anybody have this on the market at the time? I found a company that had a similar idea in the UK, but I didn't see anything anywhere else. They had like two machines out and I actually contacted them and said, listen, I want to do what you're doing. Can you work with me? I'm in the U.S. I will be a distributor for you. And they quoted me a price of $5 a pair. And they were retailing for 20 And my business brand kicked in like, their margins aren't the best. 
because if I'm buying them for five, I got to ship them over here. Let's say at two dollars a pair or two dollars, seven dollars, get them here, put them in a warehouse, pay rent, pay to put them on the site, pay for shipping. You know, all the costs, my margin is probably two dollars. How can I get them down lower? I can make my own. I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to go to China and manufacture my own. Now, it sounded real easy when I said that. It ain't. But that's what I did. I said, you know what? I don't want to I don't want to make hardly no money and hustle somebody else's brand. I'm going to start my own brand. And that's what I did. OK, what was the initial investment like? How long did it take to go from prototype to you actually have a real roll up foldable shoe in hand ready to sell? It took me four months and that's rare. And that's, again, that's very fast, very fast. And it was because I relied on my network. Now, keep in mind, I've already been an entrepreneur at this point, 10 years. This was in 2011 when I started flat out. Mm -hmm. So I had a very popular name with people that go out, athletes, entertainers, um, my college peers, they were they seen what I was doing. They would be at my events. They used my website. So they trusted me. So when I went to them, my athlete clients, entertainer clients, and my peers and said, listen, I want to start another business. I had a business plan written up. They actually invested. And I raised 250000 from people that I know, Black people that I know, Black high, worth, high net worth individuals. Wow. Okay. So stop there for a second. I want to make sure, I want to highlight this. You got this idea. You draw up your business plan. You source materials where I can get this manufactured. Do all of your due diligence. I did all of that. You tell me at that point, you're able to tap into your network, which again goes to something I preach all the time. There are no experiences that are ever wasted. Yeah. Anything you go through in life, you can best believe at some point it's going to serve a purpose yep. for you. So for you, you're doing promotion, you're doing marketing, you're working with some of these high net worth individuals anyway, just not in this capacity. Right. So when you go to them, was it was it heavy lifting? Was it a, a hard sales pitch? It How did you? Be? That's a lot of money. And a lot of the money. fact that you said it was you got it from good. black and brown people. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes. It wasn't because I had already established credibility with them. I already was a good steward of their money. They were my clients. So they seen me taking their money, using it, like I said, giving them their return, managing money well, managing business. They seen me. So that that was helpful to me. And, you know, they it was not hard. I was, I didn't, looking back, it's surprising because this is 2011. You know, I'm a black woman and I'm trying to raise money for shoes. But they, they, just, they, just, just for clarity, just for context, 2011, we were still in the middle of a major recession. This, this is this is 08, 09, 10, 11. Like, this is not a period where you would think most people would part with their money easily. But go ahead. But again, we talk about recession proof. If you're an athlete, you're still getting your check. Don't matter. If you're an entertainer, you're still getting your check. Don't matter. So I knew I had to get into those networks. Again, that was, I feel like it was a blessing. It was source. It was that inner voice saying, Dawn, go down here, do events and promotions down here. It will, you'll see later. It's like, it's like faith. You, you know, faith is a confidence in things you cannot see. And everybody say they have faith, but when it's time to exercise faith, they get scared. Talk that talk, Dawn. You know, so it's like when you walk on faith, it really means blindly taking action, not knowing what the outcome will be, but trusting that it's for your greatest good. And that's how I live my life. And that's what happened. You know, I, I was doing a lot of things in between, obviously like doing hustles, trying to make money, working the door at the club, just building my network. I worked the VIP door of the club in Atlanta, a couple of popular clubs, built my network, just very intentional, building my network, being a person of integrity, being friendly, being, you know, all these things that I didn't really realize what I would need these people for. But the key is, you all, you're supposed to build relationships when you don't need them. You don't need nothing. You just build in relationships. It could be literally ended up being 10 years before I asked them for anything. So that's how it happened with my investors. They knew me for 10 years from college or from several years of working with me and they believed in me. And again, people always say black people don't support each other. That's not my life story. I don't understand that. I've always got support from black people. 
always. I've never had a black person like try to sabotage me or in business or do, I've just never experienced that. We, we are very supportive of one another. And I, you know, I, I'm grateful for them. I wouldn't be here without them. Beautiful, such a great story, such a great story. Okay, how does this company do and how does it, because we still, you you are in the tech space. That's what you're known for. Yeah, we haven't even got to it. We haven't even got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where things get so interesting because I truly believe that the greatest entrepreneurs solve their own problems. Yeah. Like they solve, I, I, I'm having a problem. That must mean that so many other people are experiencing the same exactly. problem. Exactly. How does going from roll up shoes that women can buy when their feet hurt after partying all night, walking on heels all day, segue you into the tech space. Yeah, it brought me back to tech because the, the answer is I was selling the shoes and vending machines. I have five machines out. So in 2013, Okay, stop, 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 stop for one second. You're selling them in vending machines. Are they your vending machines or these yes. other vending machines? My vending machines. So, yeah, so I was selling them online first. 2011, we launched in April, selling them online. Mm -hmm. Constantly working on the vending machine. So I found, after a lot of hard work, not easy, but I'm going to skip that part, found someone who would believe in me enough to build a machine for me the way that I asked. I did not want a big Dorito machine. I wanted a little, like an ATM-sized machine that could go into a club because a club owner of a nice club like live in Miami where I was at he's not about to have no big clunky Dorito Correct. looking machine in his club Correct. I knew I had to make them sexy so I did it I found a guy in the UK and he, I flew over to the UK and he built them for me and then I got my shoes made in China and I met these people on Alibaba and I still work with them to this day so it's early days of Alibaba so I found him to build these machines for me and they worked. They, they, were, they were fine. They were in the club selling shoes all the time. I'm also selling online and my, my e-commerce store is growing really fast. And it's a funny story because Lala Anthony, who I wanted to be like, ended up endorsing my products for me and posting about it and helping me to grow that business. Wow. And so, you know, we're selling in there. We're selling in the, in the clubs and in the airport. We're in Atlanta airport. And I realized as a business owner, that I wasn't getting enough information and data to grow my business. It's called scaling. Grow your business from five machines to 500. How could I do that if I don't have any information? If I don't know, you know, if I can't get a customer email address at the bare minimum, customer email address, if I can't send receipts, if I can't send marketing, if I can't understand how are people using my machines? I want to know how many people walk by. I want to know if they're in a good place. Before I spend all this money building machines, I want to make sure I'm doing this the right way or I'm going to lose a ton of money. And so I spent a couple of years looking for software because that's what that's how you understand your business analytics. It's through software. In the e-commerce world, if you have a website, you use Google Analytics and they give you all kinds of information about who comes to your site, how long they stay, did they convert, what page do they look at, all these things. But in the brick and mortar physical retail world, there was no data. And I felt that I was stuck in a place where I couldn't grow. So I spent a couple of years literally looking for a software company that would essentially upgrade my machines with their technology. And I could not find anyone. And I knew that I had to do something or my business was not going to grow to where I wanted it to grow to. And so I started another business. And that's when I started Popcom, which is the tech company. And Popcom is a software company. And the foundation of Popcom is software to revolutionize automated retail, software to make dumb vending machines smart, software to help you understand what's going around, what's going on and around your machines, in front of machines, remarket, get customer email addresses, send social media messages, and just send, you know, targeted advertisements, product suggestions, all that we're used to shopping on our phone and online. That's why I got back into software because I wanted to be able to sell more shoes. And then it led to a whole nother thing. Okay. It's so much to digest in that one segment. I know. I so know. I want to peel back the layers just a little bit. I love, and for anybody who's watching this on YouTube, anybody who's listening to this on any of the streaming platforms, pay close attention. You have your shoes, and I just want to pull out this part because I think it's so 
damn smart. You have these shoes. Most people would think, let me go and try to get my shoes into the traditional brick and mortar stores, existing chains that are out there. But you knew your customer base. Mm -hmm. My customer base is me. I'm doing promotion. I'm young. I'm in the clubs. I'm on my feet. I have to get where these women are. So I think it's so interesting because you talked about the vending machines, but you didn't, I want to highlight the why. Like, like the why was I need to be where my consumer where the pain point is. At 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., when, when a young lady is leaving the club and her feet are on fire, yes. that local shoe store ain't open. Not open. But on the way out, she knows that vending machine is there. All I got to do is go put a couple of dollars in or whatever you were charging for it. And she is good, just had a good night. And she can go on home in these shoes that are readily available. I think that that is so smart. I think that that is identifying and knowing who your consumer is, where they're at. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that you started to think a little further because thinking like that in the beginning is one thing, but now you're saying, you know what? These vending machines are great, but they're dumb. Yeah. How do I smarten them up? How do I start to understand more about who's buying this product? And now you go into the tech business and yeah. start to become a software development company, yes. which is Popcom. You. Good, you know, and it all came from just trying to be disruptive of my distribution. Like you said, I went into the stores. I, I did have 47 stores carrying the product and online, but that's not where they experienced the pain point. By the time they, I mean, they go to the store, they're not, they don't need them then. It's for later, which mm -hmm. I wanted to be there right there for you when your feet hurt. And then I wanted to be there for the woman that wants to shop in advance. Like the, the thing about being a good business owner is being everywhere your customer is at. However, they want to get your product, give it to them there. But it takes data to understand that. So when I didn't have any data, I couldn't even determine if vending machines were actually really effective. I just didn't know. And that, that's why I needed to make them smarter. Okay. Before we move on, is the vending machine industry, is it over? Because when I think of vending machines, I'm like most average everyday person. I think... Pepsi Cola, I think M and M's, yep. um, Trail Mix. You are your vending machines are not that. Your vending machines are what we see at the airport. Yes, Best exactly. Buy. Mm -hmm. You know when when you're walking through an airport. Um, is this industry lucrative? Number one, is it? overcrowded because I see these things seems like everywhere. So for you to even take a chance and say, I feel I can disrupt this space. That's bold and ballsy of you to begin with. Thank but I guess that's where the software really helps you to understand. Now you're not just making a gut decision. You're making an informed decision. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And you know, it took me to deeply research to understand the industry and the potential of the industry, because you're right. I grew up here in America and we see soda and snacks and coffee. That's what vending is for. But you go to Asia, which I've spent time in China and Japan, and you'll see vending is a part of life. It's everything you can think of in vending machines, literally live crabs. They grow in hydroponic lettuce. They're selling jewelry. They're, I mean, everything is, is they're used to automated retail. The United States was just behind that curve. So when I realized that, wait a minute, they're selling so many products in other countries and the United States is not doing that because we don't have the technology available to our retailers to do it, I knew I could really disrupt an industry. And when I thought about industry disruption, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. I knew that, you know, even though it's a, I think, right, as of now, $30 billion industry in the United States, obviously around the world is a lot larger these are a lot of dumb machines. Is industry ready to be disruptive? Are they going to accept it? And it really came from the, the people creating the demand. So companies like Zoom Systems, which you referenced the Best Buy machines, they paved the way to get people in, in the habit of buying headphones, makeup, 
non-traditional thing. So I thought to myself, they've already laid the path and people are getting more comfortable shopping in vending machines, like actually shopping. Let's take it a step further and make this opportunity available to more retailers. Because the thing about Zoom Systems is this company only works with multi-million dollar businesses. I tried to work with them as flat out. I went to them first. You already have vending machines in the airport. Put me on. And what they actually said was it cost $1.5 million to do business with us. The barrier to entry was ridiculous. That means not me, not nobody that looks like me, and not any small business owner is going to pay $1.5 million to be in a vending machine. So it's like I had to increase access to this technology so, so that people who have small businesses and medium-sized businesses could actually take advantage of this distribution channel. It was very closed off because they couldn't get that access. And I knew it was two things I had to do, create technology that was affordable and then innovate the machines so that newer brands that are high tech, innovative, cool new brands would want to put their brand in this machine. And that's when I really said, okay, I got to reinvent the design. And I invented the pop shop, which is a new kind of vending machine we call a digital pop-up shop. It doesn't look anything like a vending machine at all. It's like, I remember growing up in my house and my grandma had a rotary phone and now we have this. How did you get from a rotary phone to this disruption? You know, Steve Jobs and Apple changed the way we deal with phones. We didn't even know we needed a computer in our hand. We didn't know until he told us, and now we cannot live without it. And so my thing is, you don't know you need this machine until I show it to you and tell you how it's going to change your business, increase your sales, drive traffic, help you make more money. And once I painted that story to retailers, even before I launched the, the product, they, they got it. And I got a lot of people, a lot of business owners, retailers sign on and say, if you build this machine, I'll buy it. And I use those LOIs, those letters of intent, non-legally binding, of course, to get investment dollars to, rate, to, to grow this business. I said, listen, the market wants what I'm building. I don't even know how I'm going to build it yet and what it's going to take. But if I build it, I know they will come. And that's literally what happened because it was in that period of time where retailers needed a new distribution channel and they needed to be able to get into uh, spaces that they have been kept out of. And another company that really disrupted this space was Amazon. If you realize it or not, the package lockers are in fact vending machines. Yes, they are. They are vending a product to you that you already paid for. But Amazon broke that open for us too because now people are so comfortable getting a product from a locker. And we also build technology for lockers. Got you. Okay. So let's talk raising capital because this doesn't sound cheap. Not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go? You have experience, obviously, from flat out heels. Yes. Is it the same process? Because somebody's sitting home right now, they have an ingenious idea, maybe they even have a prototype. Yes. But they know in order for me to scale, I have to raise money. Yes. What did it look like for you to raise, let's call it the first round for the pop shop? Yeah. Did you go out to Silicon Valley? Are you, uh, you know, are you going tradition? Because we all watch Shark Tank. Yes. <laughs> we, we, we think of traditional, uh, I don't know, um, venture capitalists, yes. uh, angel investors. Was that your first start? Yeah. Because I know eventually you segue into crowdfunding, but I want to get there. But let's start. Where did you start at? And, and what is needed? What does somebody need to step in front of an angel investor or a venture capitalist? Like, what is that process even look like? So good question again. And remember, I was already kind of there because I got in front of the angel investors for flat out. So I raised 250 from those people and they understood my vision for vending machines. And I already had executed on those first five. So the first people that I went to for money was them because they already understood it and they already invested in flat out. And I'm like, I need more money so that I can make the vision for flat out um, see it through with the vending machines. But instead of taking um, more money for flat out and really exhausting our resources as a shoe company trying to build vending machines, I'm going to start a separate company that their focus is vending and technology and will work together. 
And so one of my flat out investors, he actually invested $90,000. He was my first check in to Popcom. And that helped me to get the prototypes, started the renderings, build the business out. And that money actually lasted me like four years because I didn't burn it all through it. I was trying to figure it out. You know, I was just using that to build the business until 2017. I knew I needed, I knew I knew what I wanted to do, but I needed significant capital. So yes, venture capital was the next step once I had the business model figured out and understood how I was going to get to market and go to market strategy and all these things. Because venture capital is not like angel investors. They're not like, oh, I like you. Can you explain the difference for the yeah. audience? Yeah. They're not like, oh, I like you. I believe in you. They're in the business of making money. Angel investors will invest because they, they believe in you. They want to they want to get a return, of course, but they're an angel. That is a nice phrase. They, they, they're helping. VCs, venture capitalists, they raise money from limited partners, from other people who have a lot of money, and they put it into a fund. And that fund allocates investments on behalf of the greater group of investors. And that, that VC has to go out and take all this money and invest it well, because that's how they make money. That's how they live their life. That's how they get returns is by making good investments on behalf of these other people. So they're in the business of making money. That's why they call it shark tank. The deals are sharky. The terms are sharky. I'll call it the 360 deal of entrepreneurship yep. because they're in the business of making money, not helping you. Not, they're they're going to help themselves first. So in order to get better terms on that money, you have to have a lot of things figured out. Tr traction and sales is important if you have that because it gives you a, a, an advantage. You're not like asking for money for an idea. In my case, I I had more than an idea. I had some traction from the vending machines, but I hadn't built the technology yet. So that money, that first money in was expensive. I had to give up, you know, a nice amount in the beginning. I still retain over 80% of my ownership. Now I have like 45 after all these rounds. Are, are, are we talking, are we talking popcom? The software side, the, the vending side, or the shoe side? So Flat Out Appeals is a separate business. Yep. Popcom is the vending, you know, software. So, yep. so Popcom has one hardware we invented called the Pop Shop. I have a patent on that. Mm -hmm. And then we have our software and our technology. And so that's why I said, okay, I'm going to raise money from VCs for the software side because they understand this. They don't really get the shoe side. They weren't into that. I, write, I went to Techstars, which is a program for, um, it's like the Harvard of, you know, Ivy League of, of tech programs. And it's very competitive and hard to get into. And I got into that program and I graduated. When I graduated, that's when I was able to raise my first million dollars. How, how, how long is that program? It's three months. And you live there and you're in there every day. It's very intense. You're probably in there 10 hours a day, five days a week. And on the weekends, you have assignments and things to do. How, how, how large is it? How many people are in there? Um, they do 10 companies per class. So it's a global, it's global now. So there's probably at this point, a couple of thousand tech stars companies. There's some thousands now. Is it, is it very difficult to get into these programs? Very competitive. It's very difficult to get into. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. But that was what helped me to get the network of venture capital. Remember, I have an angel investor network. I have a supporter net, you know, base for my other companies, but I did not have that venture capital million dollar check writer relationship. I didn't have the half a million dollar check writer relationship. I had like 10, 20,000. My biggest check was 90,000 at this point. Mm -hmm. What year are we talking now? Okay. 2017 when I raised the first million for Popcom. Okay. But the first million you raised for Popcom, and, and again, I just want to make sure I understand the, the timeline and I want to understand how you raise this money. Yes. This money for the first million, that didn't come VC. It didn't come angel. Did it that come crowdfunding? No, that came from VC. That, that came, came, so your million came from a VC. Yes. I was one of the first, I believe I was like the 28th black woman in history to raise over a million dollars from venture capital. So it was a handful of us that even reached that million dollar mark back then. Now there's a lot more, but it was very early days and it was from venture capital. But seeing that in all the statistics that say black women raise 0.2% of venture capital, you know, that was a discouraging statistics. And I obviously passed that. The average raise for a black woman is $36,000 and I raised a million. So 
again, breaking down those barriers, but the experience was off. You know, I did, I had a lot of experiences that I just, I didn't like it. You know, this just culturally off, you know, I was in meetings with all white men. They would comment like, your hair is different every time I see you. <laughs> it's just like cultural things. Like if you look at my Instagram, my hair is different every damn week. So they would comment. I mean, they just, it just was like the disconnect. I'm just cringing. Like, I don't want to deal with y'all. Like, I don't want to deal with this shit. And that's when I said, I'm going to do something different for our next round, which was crowdfunding. Got you. Understood. Uh, just because you mentioned this earlier, but you, you kind of uh, moved past it. How much of your company did you have to give up? So in the beginning, it was these accelerator programs, they typically take six to eight percent of your company at that current valuation mm -hmm. for $125,000. That's a lot, but it's also saying your company is worth close to a million dollars. Yeah. So it's giving you a valuation that's pretty high for a new company. And that's what they do. They kind of validate you. So it is expensive in the beginning, but you know, if you can get um, into a deal that they can be diluted down as you grow and they don't keep that 8% and hold it as you are worth way more, it's, it's okay. But you also have to, have to like factor, you understand this It's like, sometimes you do have to give up something to get what you need. Absolutely. To a good partner. If it's worth it, if they're going to help you grow. And for the most part, my investors did earn you know, the equity that they do have. And the ones that did it, I bought them out in 2020 because I was tired of their shit. <laughs> oh <my Okay>. <laughs> so that leads me to another question. Besides money, what were you looking for from your investors? Like for somebody out there who is right now looking to raise money, again, we all watch Shark Tank. You, you don't go into the tank right. just looking for a they don't. check. You're right. looking to partner with somebody that can bring something to the table. So for you, when you raised your first million with, the, with your VC, what were you looking for? What did they bring to the table besides yeah. that check? More, more checks, more investors, helping me to really get more customers, making connections for me to, to get into their networks, to grow my business through customers, and then just guidance. I needed to build my team. I didn't have a co-founder. It was me. I didn't have a team. Like looking back, I'm shocked that they, I got the money. Because really? God's plan. Because I didn't have a team. I didn't have a product. I didn't come from Stanford. I didn't come from Silicon Valley. You know, I, I made it work. So I needed their help to learn how to be a technology CEO of a billion dollar tech company because that's where I wanted to go. And I had to get mentors and get groomed. And I, I needed my investors to do that for me and, and help guide me and build my team and build my board of directors, which that's what they, they did. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so you need another round of funding. This time you say, look, I went the VC direction. I, it's great, got money in, got money. just to get to this level, but I want to try something different. Yep. Talk to me about crowdfunding, why you, why you chose to go that direction. Um, and another thing I think that people would want to know, and this is a question I asked, you and I have a, a, a friend named Deshaun who is the founder of Maven. And um, he, he told me something that shocked me. He said, you know, he, he's an MBA. And he says, Sean, all of the things that I learned in school, especially when writing my business plan, they, they wanted it super detailed. It was something like a book. He said, but when he went out to Silicon Valley and he started to, uh, he went through an accelerator approach, said his business plan was condensed down to about 10 pages. Exactly. And 10 slides. Oh, exactly. Go, so go ahead. Take it from there. Exactly. No, it, it's just, I think that it's a different culture, right? And he's right. You go to school as an MBA. That's why it usually most MBAs are not good entrepreneurs because, well, Deshaun's an amazing entrepreneur because he's totally outside that model. But typically they're not because you're training this very strict way to do business. And then you go out to Silicon Valley and it's so disruptive and nothing like what you learn in business school. Most of these people are business school dropouts. They're proud to have dropped out of school to start a tech company. And so it's a very different culture and you have to get used to this, this type of culture. And like I said, some things were cool but something that I did not like, I do like the 10th page deck, even though you have to try to get as much as you can into that pitch, but the overall culture, 
I do think it was better for men in general. Not, you know, of course, it's built for white men, and black men could get a better foot in the door because they're men. And so people like Deshaun and Rodney and, and Dave Salvan, and like these are men that, you know, so many men that were able to break through these barriers of like raising significant rounds and, and it trickled down to the black women as well. You know, they definitely helped to pave the way for us. You know, he was one of the first black entrepreneurs to, to do what he's done at, at scale with his business. But I just want to try a different route. They do take a lot of your equity. They want a board seat. Um, you know, the culture I wasn't aligned with, but what I do know, which is my history is going to my community, going to my network. That's how I built every business that I ever started from my people. The difference was once you reach a certain amount of a certain stage of business as a tech company, you're no longer legally allowed to raise money from friends and family unless they're accredited, which means they make $200,000 a year as an individual 300,000 as an investor or a million net worth, which you have to prove. Okay, that excludes, that excludes a lot of our people. Most of them. That excludes 90% of our people, off yeah. right? Can, can, can you say those qualifications one more time to be considered an accredited investor? 200,000 income reported two years to the IRS as an individual. 300,000 reported two years as a couple or a million dollars documented net worth. So if my mother wanted to invest in me and she didn't meet those qualifications, I couldn't take it? No. Whoa. Not, you could in your very first round, but once you reach a certain stage, once I raised that first million from VC, mm -hmm. nobody else could get in. I've, I've changed my company. I've changed the structure. I'm now a C corporation with institutional capital. I can no longer go back. It's no longer a little, you know, self-funded bootstrap business. It's now a corporation backed by institutional capital. So in order to sit at the table with them, you have to be at a certain income level. And that law was passed in 1933. And it had not changed since 2012 when the Obama administration changed it. But this is why we did not see a significant increase in black net worth. They always talk about this black net worth thing. Throw it in our face. The reason why people are wealthy is because they have investments, which we were locked out of investments in early stage. Entrepreneurship, which again, you know, every time blacks started businesses, historically our parents and grandparents, they would burn them down. They would do things. They would gentrify the area. They put the freeways through the neighborhood, everything possible to, to stop us. And then inheritance. Well, we couldn't own anything. So we weren't getting huge inheritances from our grandparents and our parents. Our generation, us and our kids will be the first real trust fund babies in our, that are black and real money handed down. It's happening right now. And so until that law was passed to allow everyone who are non-accredited to get into early deals, there was not an opportunity to invest in the types of things that could change entire families for generations. You understand what I mean? Somebody invested Uber for $5,000, Uber went public. That same $5,000 was 25 million on the day of IPO. That changes families forever. It does, yes it does. But they don't give us those chances. I, I could have gave $5,000 for Uber. I'm sure you have five stacks that you could have gave to get 25 mil. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't call us. They didn't say, hey, Sean, hey, Dom, you want to get in this Uber deal? That's a network of people. They don't put us at the table with them. So now it is, it's democratized. Now anybody can invest in an early stage company. And that's why it was important to me because my same supporters from Urban Star, from Flat Out of Hills, from D1 Consulting, they could now invest in Popcom. And they did. They mobilized like crazy. I have... 5,000 investors now, and I've raised $4, $4 million in three from everyday people. Okay, I love that. You, you, how, many, how many different rounds of, of funding have you gone so, through? I, I'm on my third now, so I'm actually raising money now, I have to say this. I'm raising money now, startengine.com forward slash popcom, but I closed two before. I raised a million in 2019, I raised a million in 2020. And now, you know, we're at um, 800,000 on this one. So it's a million 70, and then we closed some angel money. So we raised over the past couple of years, 3 million. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And okay. it's, from people. it's from the black people that don't invest. We are investing like crazy, actually. 
Oh, you, congratulations. And kicking the stock market's ass at the same time, which I love to see that happening right now. Talk to me. I want to go back to, because uh, we spent a, a good amount of time on uh, raising capital, which I think was important, which I really wanted to focus in on this interview. I, I, I want to go back to your original business model, if you will. Who, who can benefit from, and, and we spoke about your, your pop shops. Yeah. You also have a kiosk. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to me about the difference between the pop shop vending machine and your kiosk? And for anybody out there who may not know that they need your services, what, mm-hmm. ben- what, what businesses can benefit from the products that you're creating? Thanks for that. So we're, we target retailers. So the pop shop is a machine that dispenses. It, a product comes out when you complete a transaction. It vends. The kiosk is a transactional unit. So nothing comes out. You place the order, you can transact, you know, take a survey, do whatever you want on that kiosk. The product would either need to be picked up from a counter or from where the retailer wants you to pick it up. It can be shipped to you or something like that. The case, use case for that is cannabis dispensaries because dispensing is actually illegal currently because of the federal laws, but you can still transact and order cannabis and pick it up from a counter to facilitate a speedy transaction, uh, a restaurant. So a quick service restaurant, you can order food and then pick up the food, um, you know, anywhere that needs information, taking surveys. So any business that wants to get information from a customer or wants to transact something, that's the kiosk, the actual vending machine, any retailer that has the product that can fit in bes- between a ring box and a hat box can be dispensed in our pop shop. We have a program called Pop Shop Local and we're featuring local products and they can be put into our vending machines in airports and hotels. We've negotiated free placement in these hotels to highlight local brands. And it's a program we're rolling out right now. The press release should be going out tomorrow. So it's like a sneak peek here, but um, it's a program we're focusing on local entrepreneurs to help them get more visibility. You know the the, the the COVID really hit retailers hard. A lot of them were able to bounce back and really you know ship products out. But for those that even were stuck without being able to get inventory because of their supply chain being out of the country or shipping issues, they were just really hurt last year. And we put this program in place to make it easier for them to get out there in the market with their customers by only making monthly payments. The machines are 20,000, but if you pay a thousand a month, you get all of the service, the placement, the software and the machine for a thousand a month and we'll help the brands make money. Okay, let's let's zone in here. What is the business model for your software and hardware business? How does Popcom make money? Great question. We're a software as a service company. They call that SaaS. And so our money kicks in from monthly payments for using our software. It's very much like your cell phone. You buy your phone or you pay your monthly payment on your phone. Like I'm saying, you lease the phone. I'm leasing this to own. I pay my cell phone bill every month and then I might pay my hardware payment. That's Popcom. You pay your vending machine bill every month for your hardware and you pay your data and software to make it work. Also like a Shopify, you you pay every month to have your Shopify e-commerce store to sell your products online. Then you operate your store. So we make money like that. We also make money from transactions. So every transaction we get 2.9%. And then we also make money from advertisements, which have a very strong ad network to deliver ads. And that's the key. Are these ads ads, um, that you guys are generating or the ads that the the person who buys into uh, leasing or, or buying one of your vending machines that they bring to the table? They can if they want, but they don't have to. We have a partnership with Ad Network. And what happens is we put their machine into our inventory. And what it'll say is we'll give it to an advertiser and say, okay, we have a machine in Atlanta airport, Miami airport, a hotel in San Francisco. Where do you want your ad to go? And they just deliver it through our platforms, all digital, upload their ad and click a button, pay for the ad, and it goes onto the screen. And then the retailer makes money. We take 20%. Okay, you're taking 20% off that. Okay. All the work, and then they get 80 for just having their machine. Understood. Especially if you are, if it's coming through you. Yeah, it's all coming through us. If it comes through them, no, but 
they don't want to do that. You know, well, they let's say they do want to do that. Let's say they're in the business to do that. Do they actually have to come through you to run these ads? And if they do have to come through you to upload and and let's say they have five machines out there and they want to run it across their five machines. Do you take a piece of that even though you didn't bring that advertiser to the table? Yes, it's a smaller fee under 10% because it's a platform fee because it's still pay, pay for the data to deliver that ad. Keep in mind, the ad doesn't just appear. It's a, it's an actual data plan. It has to come through and be delivered and we have to have our dashboard to manage ads and they have to have a report system because the advertisers want to know the cost per click, you know, who was viewing it and all the sure. traction. So sure. you're still paying for our ad management system, but you're not giving us a commission on the placement of those ads. Okay. I know you switch your business model. I heard you mention the number $20,000. What is that? That's the cost of the machine if you want to buy it outright. We do have about, I'd say 30% of our customers buy it outright. They, 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 Buy it. They want it. Is this the is this the pop shop or is this the kiosk? Both. But so the kiosk, gonna... the kiosk, even though it doesn't dispense, is still a twenty thousand dollar fee. No, I'm sorry. The cost of the kiosk is not. The cost of the kiosk, I believe, is eight thousand. Gotcha. And that's if they want to buy it outright. Yes, they want to buy it outright. But I love your business model because they're still on the hook to to you for the software. Yes, it's always the software. So we make our money from software. It doesn't matter about the hardware. We have a very low margin on the hardware. We don't make a lot of money from the hardware because our goal is to sell people service to power their machine. And, and we have no competitors. If you if you buy our machine, nobody else can give a software. You can't switch from like Verizon, AT&T to... No, you have to stay with Popcom. So we, we, have, a very, um, we have a very niche audience. Yeah, you have a dope... Dope, dope. And, and again, as I was researching you, I was like, you know, I want to do this interview because I think the business model is super dope. It's it's so scalable. Obviously, you know, you spoke about China and I do understand that this is a way of life in China. Like <laughs> for them, vending everything is normal. So I see such an upside and I think that you're so ahead of the curve. You know, you spoke about Zoom um, and these are just so people not thinking that it's Zoom, uh, the virtual meeting software with, and I don't even know if that's the no, same company or not. It's not but, at all. It's called Zoom Systems and they're actually, they were around before Zoom that we're, you know, using. That for we're using, video. correct. Mm -hmm. But Zoom is, is is the big kiosk that you would find at the airports that, that you know, is the best buy or any yeah. of those other, but like you said, the, the barrier entry is, to, is so great because they charge so much just to get in. It's about $1.5 million, if I quote you correct. Yep. Here you're talking, you can get in the door with Popcom, $8,000 if you want to buy the yep. kiosk. 1000 a month, 1000 down and 1000 a month. Beautiful. You try it out and see how it goes. And, you know, that's one thing about Zoom. They don't do pilots. You can't just try it out. You have to yep. go all in and commit. Before before we wrap this interview up, uh, you know, and I'm so enjoying myself right now. Where are you at with production? Uh, are there are there these kiosks in in pop shops in the marketplace as we speak? Uh, are are you waiting to have more manufacturing? Like, if, if somebody wanted to go out, test them out for themselves, see if it's something that works for them in their business. Are they in the marketplace? Yes, yeah, so we have the first one in Columbus, Ohio, in Polaris Mall. So if you're not in Columbus, you won't be able to see it. But we have 20 more coming out. They're being built now. We already have customers for all 20 of them. And they're coming out, um, he say, say like March. So once they get finished in March, then we have to deliver them. So I think they'll be live by like April, once we do transit time, installation, and all these things. But that's 20 coming out. We also have a customer in the alcohol space. I didn't even talk about this. I'm not even going to go deep into it at all. But we have technology to verify identity to sell alcohol and cannabis and regulated regulated products using facial recognition. And so we do have an alcohol customer rolling out this year as well, which we're really excited about. But if they want to test it out, they can see it in Columbus or they can go to our YouTube page, youtube.com popcom tech. And we have full product demos of the kiosk and the pop shop on our YouTube and lots of other cool videos too. So if somebody wanted to order one now, I know you have 20 that are being built. What's the waiting list for somebody? You know, this this interview comes out. Somebody said, 
That's it. That's exactly what I've been looking for. How long are they looking? Are they looking at the end of the year? Are they looking at next year before they can have their order in? No, no, it can, we will be in full production. So we can just take orders. The first 20 are being built. We're at a full manufacturing facility. They place the order. They can get into queue and they can have it in a couple of months. We would say give us 30 to 45 days in this beginning as we really fine tune our supply chain and our process, but they don't have to wait a long time. Okay, beautiful. So I have to, I have to ask, uh, just because the, the turnaround doesn't seem long at all, your, your manufacturer must be here in the United States as opposed yes. to in China. Yes, yes. Okay, okay so beautiful. We moved our vending manufacturing last year. So as a result of COVID, we were manufacturing in China and we were going to fully manufacture in China. But because of COVID, we moved it here. So we're now in Connecticut and our manufacturing partner is based there. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Got to ask before I let you go, you are a woman in business. You seem extremely focused, extremely knowledgeable about your industry. Personal life, is there a personal life? There is a young woman out there right now who is gung-ho about her career, gung-ho about making it happen, creating the next billion dollar business. How do you, is there a personal life and how do you juggle for that matter? It is a personal life. I'm married, I'm a newlywed from you know, lockdown marriage, you know, Congratulations. I have a 16 year old daughter. My daughter's been homeschooled since the second grade. So while I'm building these businesses, I'm very involved parent. Um, and there's no juggle and there's no balance. It's like prior prioritizing every day what's important and really communicating with everyone involved, your, your significant other, your family, your children, your team as to where they fall in that priority. You know, some days it's like, Hey, me time, you know, self-care time, family time, no work. Some days it's like, hey, my day at work today is crazy, y'all. I'm about to see y'all like 10 o'clock at night because I have to work all day, you know, but that's the thing. It's never going to be even, but you have to make sure as an entrepreneur, especially as, as a woman to um, make that effort to make that self-care and make time for yourself. And then I believe, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm living it. You can do both. I cook dinner for my family, you know, all the time, regularly, we have a it's not, I'm not like, oh, I'm too busy. I'm working. I can't, you know, all of that. No, because I, my, my, my motto is me first, me first, family first, then business. And that's also what my team motto is. I tell them, don't put this company before your health, your mental health, your physical health, your family, because it's going to affect us negatively. If you're good, you're feeling good. You're sleeping, you're eating, your family's right. You're spending time with your spouse, your kids. You're going to be very productive at work because you're good in your life. If you're not sleeping, not eating, you're falling apart, your wife, husband mad at you, you, you under stress, you're going to come to work and bring that stress to work. Don't bring that stress to work. Hold yourself down and then come to work. And it, it really works out for our company culture. Dope, Dawn. I, you know, you, you are an amazing example of what's possible. Uh, you're an amazing example of breaking boundaries and not being limited to uh, what society thinks you should be or could be. I love the fact that you said, hey, you know, I'm first. I put me first. I, that, that's important because especially in the world of business, we all have a tendency, especially when you're building a business, to, to put all of your eggs in that basket. And it seems like the other areas of your life suffer. And that's why you hear so often that, you know, there's so many people who are wealthy, but they're miserable, they're unhappy. So I love the fact that you have figured out a way to balance and, and still do what you love and build this incredible business. If anybody wanted to get in contact with you, where can they find you at? And also if they wanted to invest, where can they invest that? They definitely can reach me on, I'm on all social media. I'm very active on LinkedIn. If you want like business correspondence It's under Dawn Dixon, D-I-C-K-S-O-N. And then please check out our crowdfunding page. We're raising $5 million and we're about 800,000 into that five. So there's definitely room to get in. So I'm start engine at startengine.com forward slash pop com. And we just, you know, you'll be a part of something very big. This is a, this is a, Opportunity to get in early on an early stage tech company that definitely on a fast trajectory. I will also mention that just yesterday, this week, 
I was named to the Forbes Next 1000 list. So you can see me in this current month's issue of Forbes Magazine, the March issue, and also online at Forbes.com. And there's a great video showing the vending machine and, and, and with some history about Popcom too. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Dawn, you know, I enjoyed this conversation with you. I, I think what you're doing is incredible. I think you are a role model, um, not just to women, not just to black women, but to people, to anybody who wants more in this life. You're showing that if you put in the work, if you are willing to sacrifice and do uh, your part, you can grow a business from start to now you're, you're raising $5 million. I just think it's incredible. I think you stuck in the worth 32, $31.3 million. So yeah. It's talk that talk, Dawn. Go ahead. Make sure, make, hold up, Sean. No, no, I'm worth, the company's I'm worth 32, 30 million. 5 million, but the company's <laughs> worth 30 million, okay? Be clear, I'm, I'm clear. <laughs> but I, I, I thank you for taking the time out. Uh, I wish you all the success in the world and you are a true power move maker. Thank you so much. Thank you. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, Feel free to share. Peace and love.